Ministry for Primary Industries and um, and uh, recently a bit for uh, Ministry for Business, Innovation and Employment. Um, hang on, I just thought that. Right, so uh, this is a talk I gave here not too long ago. Um, so yeah, because we've been, we've been a bit contracted by MB to kind of making some plots, uh, turning the previous uh, regional economic report into yeah, their, their graphics, uh, into so updated graphics but using R, and uh, build up a bit the, the R capacity over there. And, um, and so I gave this talk, so few of you were here last time, so it's not going to be very new for you, sorry, it might be a bit boring, but um, uh, hopefully for some of you it's going to be uh, kind of new. Uh, I'm kind of, kind of assuming that you have some knowledge of R here, and sorry if it's a bit too much, but uh, don't worry, everything is in the repository, there's a workable example that will be self-contained that you can download and play with if... Uh, this is way too much at the moment. But um, yes, so at first, um, so I'm just going to show some examples of Adlens plots in uh, just using R. Um, and uh, then, yeah, so we'll start with this. And then we'll uh, introduce kind of uh, the improvement from the R based graphics, starting from R based graphics and going towards ggplot and customization. A little bit on preparation of data to, before graphics. Uh, the basics of um, plotting with ggplot and grid graphics and um, a little bit of subplots, that's part of a, if you want to customize plots, it's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty um, nice thing to add to your toolbox. And a little bit of styling. So yes, I'm going to start with some, uh, some examples of the plots I created for MB. And uh, so the main thing here is Everything has been it has been done using programming, so it's all scripted, and um, and using R, so that's why we are here, and um, and so hopefully the scripts for all the plots will be made available once the report will be completed. So just start with like a series, like different time series for different regions. That's the annual employment growth in different regions. The blue lines is the, the employment growth in each region compared to to the New Zealand average, and so you can compare both. So that, that's kind of something not too, fa too, fa too fancy <laughs> yet, but it's still something like adding a double axis there, like it would like a customized label. Uh, so that's, 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 that's one. And then a bit more, slightly, slightly more, but not that fundamentally different from what you would have seen somewhere else. But So this is about growth rate in Tourism, international tourism expenditure. So for different regions, so with a bar scale, like a sequential palette there, and uh, a circle size that shows the tourism expenditure in each region. So like moving it, moving towards like infographics, more showing quantities and in a bit of an abstract way. More abstract again, this is a bit more complicated, more complicated, like showing two quantities, the size of the bubble showing the regional GDP and, um, and the color of the bubble uh, shows the change in the GDP over three years in that case or something. And the connections between each regional centers like, are showing the distance and the time for traveling between centers. So again, we customize labeling there and start showing quite a bit of information. Um, that's one fairly complete, one complete. The contrast is not that great. It looks better like on a PDF, but sorry for that. So I guess it's not really designed for display on screen quite yet. But so it's showing every territorial authority is there and the change of um, projected populations, uh, population change. So like a mix of inset graphics and, and labeling as well. Right, this is yeah, that's getting quite different from what we use with R, showing a lot of information. So we've got we've got energy production. So we've got a different centers, different power plants of different types. The size shows the capacity, the production of each plant. The line shows the main grid, the power grid in New Zealand, and the color of the regions shows the demand. So quite a bit of information there. 
and that requires quite a lot of customization. But it is doable only using R. That's a good. That's a good thing. Um, there we've got the regional network in terms of transports. So we've got the main roads connecting every port, and we've got the import export. It's um, in green as a trade value, in blue as a trade volume. The dark is the import, so yeah, the more clear color is exports. So for each port, so different different subplots. So we've got four numbers for each for each subplot, two colors for different types. Road network with different traffic. So again, quite a lot of information in this, and. Um, and yeah, and again, so a designer could do this, but it, it is good to do that via programming as we did. And um, so you can you can ask yourself like, oh well, why the pain of going through programming, except that R oh, is free and all this. But uh, the most important thing about using programming for this type of graphics is, especially when it comes to reporting, especially like an organization like MB is that plots are easy to update with new data. All of this is coming from like CSV files. You've got new, da new data arriving, you rerun your script, and uh, you know, there you go, you've got your plot updated. Otherwise, you would have to resend everything to the designer, would have to start pretty much from, from scratch. Uh, the code is easy to reuse and adapt. Um, even like a non-programmer potentially can just change the value of a variable for the color or something and, and rerun and update the plot. Um, I'm advising you for to use GNU Make for connecting all the scripts together, and that's good, and that gives another another way of looking at the, the whole process. Uh, it's easily scalable for for the program. It doesn't matter if you're plotting five regions with five different colors or ten thousand, or the designer, uh, I'm just, I'm, I suppose, would be a bit quite different. Um, Ch changes are easy to try, that's quite important. If you want to follow the process of either making the plot or changing the plot, who changed the plot, and um, like tracking bugs, or just just more transparently this way. And I suggest to, for you to use Git for, for that, for version control, that's pretty good. Uh, again, it's transparent, everything you can, you can read, and everything is not lost. There's no click that you would lose, it's just the code. Showing, showing pretty much the whole process from start to finish. But probably the most important thing is the, the plot just reflects the data directly. There's no hand tweaking of the bubble sizes for the region, for the circles, or uh, the region colors. What you see is directly direct derived from the original data. And this, I guess, gives quite a bit of insurance of the quality of the plot you get in the end. So how do we get there? So, well, R is great. R is great for many things, and plotting and statistical analysis mainly. Sim simple plots are quite quick and easy to make, like just like pretty much in one line, one line of command you can do a fairly, fairly complicated thing that would take quite a, quite a bit of time in Excel, I'm sure. And, um, but the thing is it lacks a bit of finesse and it's not that easy to customize directly. Um, then Hadley Wickham came up with his awesome ggplot2 package that provided a grammar of graphics and, and a visual style as well. So that, that, I think people started considering R like seriously when they started seeing the, the, the outcome of this. And again, in a quite a nice, quite a nice way of, of writing uh, the code. And uh, the language of graphics, the grammar of graphics is great because it makes everything straightforward and consistent, but unfortunately, it's as well, it constrains you. It's really hard to really uh, customize plots directly. And, um, but at the same time, it still provides the basis for something that you can tweak, and I think it's, it's good. <coughs> Sorry. It's good to recognize this, and um, the, fact, the fact that ggplot is built on grid graphics, so there's several types of graf graphics in R, and grid, graf grid graphics provides the basis for ggplot too. And uh, there's a lot of <coughs> low-level functionalities of grid graphics that can be used for, for customizing your plots. And um, some purists would say, oh, customizing too much is not good, but sometimes you really have to customize when, for example, a speci specific style or design is required, like either from a client journal organization, or if you want to 
a lot of information in a single figure, like you mix, you lack some space in your publication or something. And um, and like like plots become more like infographics. It's like you for, you start forgetting about axes and units and but more like a mixer of mix of graphical elements and, and to represent data really. There are many libraries available in R for graphics and customization and do a lot of various things. Um, but here I'm going to focus on ggplot2 and grid. And I'm mainly going to go through this plot I showed you before. Um, so first, the data, before, before starting on the graphics, you need to prepare, prepare the data. In this case, it's coming from a GIS shapefile. Shapefile is us. So we've got the shape of New Zealand and we've got the network, the road traffic there. We've got a spreadsheet with the port location and the position tweak. So this does something I googled a lot long for each port and added some offset columns to like just to move, to move the, the subplots away from the main centers. Um, and the spreadsheets with the values we want, like so the bar, so the import, export, and values and volumes. Um, so dealing with shape files in R is quite straightforward using the SP package in RGDAR. You just you just use the function R read or GR, you specify the folder where the shape file is and the projection. You can transform the projection so this is that just that long and using the New Zealand um, is a transverse vector projection to play to to play in meters. That's much more convenient. And in ggplot, before before displaying special objects, ggplot does not handle special objects directly. You need to fortify this so it converts the special objects in a data frame of x and y's, which are a bit easy to that cannot that can G, that ggplot can handle. Uh, spreadsheets generally you've got like a list of locations with x and y's. That's pretty pretty straightforward to read them in R, and you t transform them as a special objects using coordinates and approach for, for string uh, function to uh, specify the, geograph the geographical coordinate. And you can say we can do transform because like for um, I'm always working in NZTM, so the New Zealand transverse transverse market for for to play meters, but. Um, for example, to get the coordinates, I just Google like long for each location there. So you need to play a bit of a transformation, but just a one liner where it is not nothing really difficult in there. In terms of data, so for the import I exports, is often coming in that form, kind of wide format with years as columns and regions or whatever on that as rows. Uh, this is quite unusable directly. You always need to transform them into normalized normalized format, so one line per row or per point or per region, whatever you're dealing with, but the quant one quantity per line, pretty much. And um, the library we shake to makes it quite easy using the med function to turn, like in one line you can go from the top to the bottom. It's quite, it's quite a good one. So now we've got the data pretty much prepared, uh, we can start doing the base map. So I'm using ggplot for this one after for the, using the fortify function on each, on each thing. So we just start specifying the limits of your map, then you use the geom polygon, and that's for, the, that's for the New Zealand, so that's just for the shape of New Zealand. Then geom path for the, for the traffic, for the traffic roads. Um, and these this two because there was the black one, there was the special, special high traffic ones, and the smaller one. Then you specify the colors of the traffic. So you've got the, um, the color equals trap there. So you specify that the, the color of the line will be depending on the traffic. So and then you specify the scale, the palette used to map the values to the colors. So it's not that difficult there. And then calling it fixed ratio equals one so that because we're in meters, so that you don't end up with New Zealand really wide or just just right. And thin blank to remove, so that's a little function, uh, just a little thin adapted, just to remove all the axis and all the extra background and everything that comes by default in ggplot. Um, in this example, so we set up some kind of a, some little variables that you generally keep at the top of the script, just so that they are easy to change, and no, like people are not really 
used to R don't have to go through the whole script and understand before changing the things that they want to change. So, and um, and for the colors, for the mapping the colors, I quite like using this this approach, with, which is root cause in this case. It's just a discrete uh, vector, a name vector where each each value of the traffic, like less than ten thousand cars a day, is mapped to red and something like this. It's quite, it's quite convenient. Um, but I'm just going to go via the little subplot creation because that was that caused me a bit, a bit of grief when I had I started learning that by myself. So it's not that it's not that flash. It's, it's actually kind of a composite, uh, fairly standard uh, plot, but just put together. So this, let to talk a bit quickly about viewports in grid graphics. Um, so viewports are quite quite of a handy handy construction in grid graphics. It's pretty much like imagine you've got the main plot, and you can add all the canvas, and you can rotate them. You can have like different sizes, and they're different like coordinate systems in there. In this case, it's quite easy. There is like three view viewports. So how do you define them? Um, first, uh, I decided to base. Uh, the size, the dimension of the bars, and the, the, the size of the subplot from the little logo in the middle there, which in grid graphics, in this case, is turned into a grub, a graphical object. So the logo is just a PNG, so it's like a normal graphical, graphical image that you read with a read PNG from the PNG package, and then you turn into a grub. And so this defines a little unit in the middle, and then you put the, you create the viewports using push viewport and the viewport and grid layout functions to say that I want a large one there, the, the local there, and a third one there. So with the respective sizes that are relative to the, the grob height. So but in this case, it's a square, so you've got one by one. And um, so it looks a bit funny at first, but it actually it actually, it actually does make sense. It's not, uh, but you, the good thing is that you really constrain it, and it's all relative to each other. So after you can, you've got pretty much an object you can play with quite easily. And so inside the little subplot, there is actually a normal ggplot function like a bar plot. So it's just using a geom bar, and you specify the height of each bar. You could have done that just using grid graphics. And again, you specify the colors, and you just flip it to make it horizontal, and and a bit of theming there to remove all axes. So you add one, like you add one to the viewport on the right, <coughs> you, you create another one, and you add it to the viewport on the on the left, and you add it to the viewport just by taking the objects like bar was there, you transform it into a graphical object, and you use grid to draw this this group. You can also, yeah, this, 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 like this, anything in R, there's many ways of doing things, but this is one approach. So now you've got your little subplot as an object. How do you plot it to the map? That's funny, it's really looking different from the screen. But, um, um, so in, you the push viewport and grid row, so that's the part, the part there, so this is a bit kind of nested. Um, yeah, you just grab it. That's, that's, a great, that's a great expression. It, it just grabs everything you draw in there and puts it, puts it in, in a, its in own graphical object. And then you can use the ggplot annotation custom to add it wherever you want. And uh, so the good thing about annotation custom is, in this case, you're using user coordinates. So the location, log x and log y, are actually, in this case, in meters. That's the kind of coordinates you can read from the map or using any GIS software. So, so that, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Well, that's, that's it for that, sorry. Um, so you're talking about user coordinates, that's another thing that you, that's good to know how to do that. Is, um, the big problem with ggplot is, is using grid graphics, but is using in the viewport in a viewport is using his own calculation for the scale. So once you plot a ggplot object, it's, it's pretty much, it's pretty hard. It's not intuitive at all how to get back to the plot and be able to add, like on the map, when I want to add a circle around Wellington, for example. 
But um, again, it took me a while to find out this, but this little trick seems to be working quite well. So you do a ggplot. So that's the map, that's the main base map we did. You print it and uh, you actually rebuild it in memory and you extract by building it. So it's turning the ggplot into a grid graphics. You extract the, uh, the scale that it created because everything is created on the fly by ggplot. But it's not, it's not obvious how to get it. So it's, it's alright, it's only three lines. But once you're there, you down viewports, so you go down the viewport of ggplot in this case, and once you're there, you can use the native unit of grid to be able to plot everything you want in the ggplot plot. So that works because we are talking about media, there's, there's no fancy, I don't think that, would, that shouldn't work as soon as you use in ggplot like a logarithmic scale that you haven't defined manually, but most of the case, you can use a transformation probably for uh, to go from a linear scale to a non-linear scale. But yeah, this technique is something I ended up using a lot because as soon as you want to plot your own legion somewhere that really relates to the data, the native, you want to play the native scale there. Um, and grid, once you've got the map, for example, like grid, is, grid is great. It's got pre pl plenty of primitive shapes, like rectangles, like, like rounded rectangles, and text and arrows, and like, or ellipses. It's got a lot of different primitives that you can add to add your own annotation and really have, really have control of your, of your plot in this case. A um, good thing with grid graphics as well is that you, you can change you, you can do a mix of units. So, for example, you want to place some text at, at X. Um, you can use a mixture of your native coordinates, which is like again like your map coordinates, but plus three millimeters of, of the plot device. So that if you want a specific, like a consistent, for example, spacing between your legend symbols or text, uh, you can really have control of this, which I don't think you can do in base graphics. Um, so a bit of sugar now is um, so a bit of styling with ggplot. So uh, with the new new newish versions of ggplot, you can use a theme, the theme option there, which uh, allows you to specify a lot lot of different theming elements, like so that the axis ticks length or panel background. Um, and when you start, you know, when you try to apply a style like we did for MB, that was kind of decided by the designer, uh, that systematically you want to replace this into a function so that you keep it, you source the same file every time and you can just do a word, a title for example, wherever you wherever I want. And using the same style, the same style of the time. Uh, with grid, it's pretty similar, but it's just when you do, when you plot an object, you just need to use the GP equals GPAR function and to specify different colors, you end up you generally end up doing that all the time. So it's much easier to put that in a different function. And um, and that's it. So depending on your background, I might be that might might be a bit bit much all this. But um, if you go to the Git, this GitHub site, you can do, you can have the old data and the code to actually plot to make the the plot I I showed you the map and. Um, and the presentation as well, which has been made with uh, Nita. And um, yeah, and thank you for thank you guys, and thank you for the whole R and open source community for making all this happen. Um, and yeah, just for for to make this, I just used R, LaTeX, Beamer, GNUMEG, Git, and Emacs, all open source and fantastic software. And uh, that's it. You know the maps that you plot, uh, the icon of those uh, legends, was, was that image file? Um, those ones the there? Was, yeah, was it? Yeah, 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 so this was, um, yeah, those were there. Uh, so they are just a PNG little icon, either that you make by yourself. You can, yeah, you can do that with SVG as well. So you have to just, yeah, design it and then 
Yeah, it's actually, like, yeah, yeah, no, I don't have a function. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually coming from the designer. I mean, in this case, it's actually a screen capture from the previous report. <laughs> but I, you know, know that, yeah, I did manage in another one to take the PDF of the report and get to the element using Inkscape. So you can, yeah, no, that does, yeah, these, these are the only, the only menu thing pretty much. But it's really, really easy to import it and play with. How, how much you need to pay attention to the size of the PNG? Is it, it can be too big or too small in terms of resolution? If it's too high resolution, what happens to it when it's got too small space? Well, either you resize it manually or there are some functions to resize it. Surprise what it looks like. And For me, that, yeah, in that case, I, I found it easier to do it manually. But, yeah, recently, so yeah, it's, it's always. <coughs> As you probably know, all this knowledge is kind of something you you learn every day, and well, every day you learn more. And yeah, some things I would have changed probably if I had to, re to recreate that now. Uh, but yeah, the, the SVG approach is quite good. So it's a vector, it's a vector format, and the, the size doesn't matter in this case. You just specify in your code what size you want, and it scales, it scales really well because it's vector, it's not. So there's three SVG packets, or. Um, I don't remember the SVG one. I can find out for you, but I think it is, yeah. I can, yeah. If you remind me later, I can find that for you. One of the things we really dig about this in MB from our perspective is that if you go back to the picture again, which one? Is, yeah, uh, that, yeah, that one, is that all of that is, is, is made dynamically. So this is a report which were. were we're going to be doing year in, year out, year after, year, uh, year after, and um, the data looks after itself. So it's a, it's a straight feed from, from, from Stats New Zealand. Everything is, uh, it, as everything gets revised next year, the data will look after itself and the graph will recreate itself. And it's, a, it, it's, it's production ready quality, it's, 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 it's printer ready, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's no touchy. We don't need to do anything with it. And uh, it, uh, as as Barn said, it's it's built modular, so we can move things around and, and, and readapt this. If we want to, uh, if we want to convert that into, show them the last one, energy generation. Oh, yeah. That one. That one. That's that's something similar. We just plugged in another data source. <coughs> So uh, it's, it's we had a few iterations of that one. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> so it's not easy, but um, look at it; it's done. Once it's done, yeah, it was weird. Yeah. How much would that have? How much time would that have taken for the designers to make every year? You should ask a designer for that. Was <laughs> <laughs> it? I never play with a designer. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe you know, James. No, no idea. Year, I think I think it took a while. No idea, but it, everything is movable and changeable. Like if we change our, our well, heavens to say there's election this year and a new government comes in and everything goes red or something like that, uh, which is the sort of stuff we need to respond to, uh, it's, it's easy to do that. It's, it's, it's just a, a twist of the colour scheme and off we go, we've got a new graph ready. So it's, uh, from our perspective, moving down this modular path to the creation of our, uh, of our publications it's just been an absolute godsend. I don't know how, how we would have done this in, 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 in other packages. Mm. And if it's it. done by hand, you don't know if it's right. right? Mm. Especially in the rush, which generally happens. Mm. You, you update, like, oh, we just received some new, some new data, please update with this. And you can imagine the guy going manually, and in the end, you, you because somebody is responsible for the quality of the thing, going through every point, making sure it's fine. At least this because the process is all established and actually fairly straightforward. Then you can just update and be confident it's there. Of course you check, you double check, but but yeah, and you never have any bad surprises in this case. The first time we did our regional economic activity report, it took us eighteen months. We did such a good job that Minister Joyce said, That's fantastic, do us another one next year. <laughs> <laughs> so unless we had something like this which which did it programmatically, uh, we would have never made those time frames. So, I take it you're recycling this code quite extensively for yep. different projects? Absolutely we are. We're going nuts with it. Cool. Did it change the way that you, you, know, you worked 
Uh, did you go? Did you start doing more iterative process? Well, we had to adapt the way we worked. So, so, so rather than everything about it being about analysts doing clever things like this. Uh, the whole uh, our development lifecycle is now very much uh, IT production focused. We use GitHub and and, and uh, 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 tools like that to maintain uh, maintain version control. And uh, yeah, everything it, everything is done very very much uh, like an IT house would do IT. And uh, yeah, we're a bunch of analysts. I'm I'm an economist. We've got a, a, a psychologist, and uh, Ilka here is a geneticist. So uh, we've We've all moved into, the, uh, uh, into very much an IT focus to be able to do things like this. But it's, it's been easy to do. It's, a, it's, it's quite an easy transformation. Mm. Dragonfly shows how to do it, but now we've got the tool set, and it's fantastic. Off we go. Can you say something about uh, GNU Make? Is that, uh, is that uh, makes it easier to handle large numbers of blocks, or how do you do that uh, Make? Well, that goes with the whole reproducibility framework. Like, once, for example, I've got everything in there, all these plots and more in the single repository. And so I, I, like, I like distinguishing the data preparation with the graphics because the plots can call the same data, but you can make different versions. And, and uh, in the end, you end up with plenty of our scripts around and suddenly somebody sends you new data. Like, okay, where do I start? Uh, how do I know that I rerun this single script to update things and because it's generally the whole process. Can you browse on a computer to GitHub? Uh, I don't know, is it connected yeah. to internet? It's internet connected. And yeah, all this is now freely available for you guys. Go nuts. Go make, go make beautiful things. You can use Internet Explorer with Gutama. Try it. Let's try it. Would most of the data that's been pushed into the graphing routines have been, would it have been manipulated in R ahead of time, or is that coming from a different range of tools, and you're putting it into the data interchange format and getting it? Uh, well, most of it came from uh, most of it came from Stats New Zealand. Like all of the shape files came from them, uh, and, and they make it publicly available. All the imports, exports data were CSV files we pulled off in the mv.stat or, or, or apposhare. Uh, the, the transport data, where that's in the road networks, we had to ask the Ministry of Transport for, transport for that. So we got that as a CSV from them. Um, oh, I see. In, in, in GDPod, you can GDPod actually calculate some functions for you on the fly, so you can, you can almost in some instances or parts that just do data frame and we'll, we'll do things for you. And actually, that's mm -hmm. what I found. Is that um, we so just thing. ignore that. Yeah, it should work. Um, So yeah, that's just the example of the workable example. So everything you need to. <coughs> yeah, I think they're not lying when they say they don't support it. Jim, just click on the make file. That was all I wanted to. Do. But yeah, so I always have a make file somewhere, which yeah, the quality of the screen is not that great at all. But it's that's that's what I need. Yeah, no, that's not this one. This one is for the make file of the presentation. Mm -hmm. That is really small, of course. But there. So when you specify in a make file, your final output, in this case, is the map, the PDF, PDF file. Then the PDF file depends on a bunch of files, so the, the two logos, the locations of the port, that's a CSV file, a bunch of functions that are put in the R files, I've got two, two files for helper functions. And the R data file there contains the GIS shape files that have been prepared. Um, and that's the data about import export and uh, the R script to make the block. And if anything changes, it runs that command, the R script to create this. And at the same time, that, so the data with the GIS information there depends on the raw data, so a bunch of ship files and the script to prepare this. And so if anything changes, and it's quite clever, and from just this you can read and you can make it as complicated as you want, but generally when I go back to a project, uh, that's the first thing I look at, the make file, because it's all documented, the whole process. And you know that if anything of this changed, 
you can do make and it is going to rerun everything necessary and you can you are really you free your mind about really trying to remember what you did last time and what file you called to update what you needed and yeah I mean I even have I even made, made little, yeah, little program to actually show graphically the dependencies of all this and it's in this case I didn't do it because it's too simple but so some projects it does help to make sure everything is connected and yeah that's the only thing you need to make sure that these files are actually used by by your file by your by your script but that's quite that's quite nothing it's nothing compared to the hassle I bumped into during my, during my PhD for example when you end up having files everywhere and you just lose trust of the quality of what you do but with this it's such yeah a lot more comfortable can those uh, references to where the data are be uh, linked to internet or SQL query database? I don't think it will, uh, guess not. No, I guess I don't think you can link, link the but hard disk somewhere. No, I mean, I think that I think that Make itself is not capable of going and fetching those things, but you can write Make is fairly low level, and you can write any code that can go and grab something. If that's, if that's how you want it to run. Really yeah, it can go and find the file and bring it in. Mm. Um, yeah. You don't want to throw the data yourself, you want to get it from somewhere. Yeah, so, so we have we use make files against databases so we don't store the data, we just pull it out. Mm. Yeah. What question? Um, so if you guys are using GitHub, are you a SharePoint site or are you using as a preference to SharePoint or instead of SharePoint? Um, we use SharePoint for our intranet, but we don't use SharePoint uh, uh, in, in how, how we do our work. Uh, we do everything GitHub, and the reason for that is because of the five people working on this piece uh, on this on the software, we've got five different locations where they're all developing in, in, in one single master location. So um, we can keep track of, of all the version control aspects to it and, and roll it back. And the des decentralized nature of that of that way of working just fits. We like mm -hmm. it. And uh, we can op uh, we open it up for these guys, and they, they work all around the planet and stuff like that. I know on Mars, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. So uh, that's that's the main thing. We stay away from uh, open source uh, from from proprietary products and move forward forward towards open source uh, because uh, yeah, open source interoperability. We, we can make mm -hmm. it available the code, and, and you guys can can pull and download it. So therefore, the trust is built up in our statistics. In our analysis, so it's it, it, it's just got so many more more threads going going for it, which is why why we hit down the GitHub path. Mm. And are you writing your reports directly on LaTeX as well, not using Word? So you've like tossed Word aside, which is why you're using this Word. Well, that's another project we've got Dragonfly working on. <laughs> <laughs> Have a go with that, Billy. <laughs> Watch that space. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, yeah. <laughs> so um, okay, I, th I think we can leave it there. Yep. So thank, thanks very much, Evan, and I'll give you some light in a couple of minutes, and um, yep. uh, we'll move present. Yep. Yep.